uh, you know, I was asked to really correlate it to um, um, uh, carbon sequestration and how basically, uh, you know, the forestry sector as a whole and tree improvement in particular going to contribute towards uh, environmental factors in terms of maintaining those, you know, carbon uh, sequestration cycles or climate change cycles appropriately. You know, we, we, we have been knowing it very well that uh, uh, a tree absorbs so much of carbon and it absorbs and stores it for a long, long time. So it's simple philosophy, a philosophy which does not require much of the knowledge a tree which grows short, I mean, uh, with, a, with a lower speed or slow speed would not be that much, uh, uh, you know, useful in terms of sequestering higher carbon, uh, carbon dioxide in comparison to those trees which sequester more. And this gives me uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, drives me rather to another uh, uh, simple philosophy which Dr. Sivani would also be knowing. Uh, I, I always say, that you know, this Earth planet is has got limited area. We all know the area is limited. Now it's up to us whether we grow more trees of poor quality on larger areas, or we grow lesser trees with higher qualities, lesser number of trees with higher qualities, manage them properly, use them properly. I feel there's a there's a scientific study which says that. You know, 90% of, uh, again, I'm using this example, which is which is very classical example. In a population, it is the 10% of those higher productive individuals, which carry with them those 90% non-productive individuals. So if you can take the performance of those 10% individuals, which contributes to about 90%, and this 90% contribute to only 10%, so it's up to you whether using the genetics tool, using the building tools, using other tree improvement program, you want to have a population which is as good as that of 90%, 90% of the total population of today, which contributes to about, uh, I mean, sorry, 10% of the population today, which contributes to about 90% of the biomass, or you want a population which contributes only 10%. I would go for the first option where you would like to have only limited number of trees good growing trees, which can contribute to a substantial higher levels. So agroforestry for that matter is one such aspect, which really gives you a you know, different uh, uh, picture altogether and has potential to really reduce uh, carbon dioxide to a substantial level. Agroforestry, when we say this agroforestry is nothing but growing trees with other uh, systems of agriculture, horticulture, animal husbandry, fishery, so on and so forth. So when you can plug into these aspects together with good tree improvement program, I feel the net genetic gain would be going to higher, very, very substantially high, but it is also going to have a direct impact on the carbon basically sequestered using those uh, uh, you know, genetic trees. And uh, one more factor I, I feel uh, this is uh, this is somehow was coming to me uh, very recently. When you say genetically modified organisms, whereby you change the, uh, you know, uh, at, at a molecular level, you change uh, genetic composition of an individual. Uh, we have uh, very restricted issues uh, uh, with this in India. Uh, we are not, uh, due to some or other reasons, more of political reason than of scientific reasons, we are not for genetically modified organisms because we say that you know they are going to have uh, an impact on our health but i feel this is one area trees which are used for various purposes and majority of times they are used for long term uh, investments of carbon maybe in terms of furniture in terms of many other things i feel if gmos could be developed in forestry they would have no in uh, you know uh, adverse impact on the environment or on the health of an individual so this is potentially one of such uh, you know, areas where one could think of having GMOs. Let's come one by one. Uh, provenance trial, as I said, uh, these provenance trials, as I explained, depend on uh, the environmental conditions. We have conducted such trials 
in uh, many of the species. Uh, but unfortunately, due to some or other reason, either scientific or political or uh, something other, which I feel is not correct to discuss here, we have discontinued with this, which I feel is a, is a very, 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 very serious issue. And we need to really continue with the provenance trials. Unless these uh, issues of provenance trials go, unless these provenance trials keep performing very well in our uh, you know, uh, forest, uh, for, for genetic improvement, perhaps our uh, road ahead would not be that smoother. Uh, if I can give you an example of uh, Malena arborea, uh, Lauridson in 1966 had conducted uh, an all India coordinated uh, proneness trial in about uh, 37 or 38 countries. And he concluded uh, his, his uh, you know, uh, results after some time. And he found three provenances from India had been doing very well across. Um, um, one was from South India, another was from, from Central India, precisely from uh, Urisha, and one was from uh, you know Northeast. It basically, it was uh, Karshiyong provenance, which consisted part of uh, West Bengal and uh, Northeast in India, um, Baksa Tiger Reserve, and uh, 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 you know this one and then uh, up to uh, Meghalaya and um, uh, Nagaland. So this was one provenance which were doing very well. These provenances, out of these provenances, Costa Rica changed whole perception of uh, wood production. And today, uh, you know, Costa Rica depends so much, so much on, uh, on Malayana Arborea. Today, like we, in India, we either depend on Casuarina Equisitifolia or Eucalypts or, uh, uh, you know, uh, popular. Costa Rica depends basically on uh, 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 Malayana Arborea. So this is the power of uh, previous trial. This keeps, this gives you so much of energy. This gives you so much of diversity in terms of genetic diversity that you can play on, play on and develop long-term programs from a single proneness. Because each seed of each of the family is a divergent population by its own. So once we start playing at a micro level, it, it, it changes a big it changes to a big deal. Then progeny trials, as I said, you have to you have to essentially collect seed from those plus trees, grow them individually, put them in the trial, and then see their performance individual by individual, progeny by progeny. And that gives you so much of information that you really feel thrilled. And I have given a theoretical aspect earlier. Let's take few examples of variability, how it matters. This is all these five photographs, if I, you could see, all these five, five, five photographs are Melana arborea. And to begin with, you see at this flower, this is completely, completely yellow flowers. Beautiful flower, come to second flower, you could see by yourself, it's a brownish, a, a combination of uh, little yellow and more of brown. Come here, it's almost equal of uh, yellow and brown. Come here, you find a different uh, flower color and you find different flower color here. So when you see these flower colors to you don't look very big. They are not very big deals. They are flowers, therefore they have to be of different colors. But if you are a breeder, you would look from them from a different point of view. These are the factors you would note you will, you know, scale them. And once you scale them, you note them, they are going to be useful in your building program. Let's go one slide up. Once, see, these, these, these smaller things do nothing. But what I have done here, next slide, I have taken this photograph and I have taken this photograph. Here, it looks like the flower intensity was not more, but they were equally flower, equally flower. So I have taken these to next uh, slide. And you could just see the color of flower. We thought there has not much, uh, you know, uh, deal. But if you look at the color of the flower and seed setting, you could just see what the seed number of seeds set here and what the number of seeds set here. And this was invariably. This was invariably whatever number of genotypes was having this flower, this uh, type of flower was very good, very very good seed bearers. But in this case, they were very poor seed bearers. You could just see this. Now, next, next one. 
See, this is small difference. This is very, 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 very small difference. You find here the fruits are of peach type, where I am not required to explain. They are, you know, very, you know, uh, tapering kind of ends. You just see very sharp ends. They are very small, uh, you know, uh, uh, pear kind of fruits. You have oblong, you have round flower fruits, you have tapering and long ended uh, fruits. But you, if when you see their impact in real population, they have got a role to play. They have got a bigger role to play. Now let's, this I was talking about external factors. Let's take now some internal factors in case of wood. There are three factors I have just uh, talking about here is the specific uh, gravity. You take, uh, you know, wood uh, of different genotypes. You could just see how, uh, you know, the specific gravity of different woods of a single species, species of Melina, I'm sorry, Melia dubia or here. You just could see it has been varying so much. The, the, the mean is about 0.39 but it has been varying so much. Then so, same is the case, oh, personally wise, it, it is differing so, lower, so much. The slink case, the permeability. These are the factors. Those are some of those external factors I, I have spoken, where color, color of the flower, the fruit size, the fruit shape, uh, you know, and the inflorescence type of uh, thing, they are external uh, you know, factors. These are internal factors which are which are established or analyzed. Uh, once you you harvest the wood, you destroy a tree and analyze it. That's a kind of uh, you know uh, uh, a variation you find, and therefore your 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 endeavor should basically be analyzing these factors without destroying the trees. But both these parameters are essentially required to exactly know what exactly is the total status of the variability or diversity of a species has totally been. Now look at uh, another uh, another species I'm talking about, name. Look at the seed, seed uh, color, seed shape. This is basically fruits of name, you could just see. Now let's, I have depulped them. After depulping, the kind of uh, variability in seeds you find, you, you have uh, very long seeds, you have little thicker seeds, you have different kind of seeds available with you. And this uh, we have done this study, we have done right from north to south, east to west. And we found so much of variability exists in name that is Ajayagata Indica. And again, I would say, perhaps this extent of variability would have not been possible had I been working with an, uh, you know, exotics. Um, since I'm working with indigenous crops, I'm finding such a such a high degree of variability available with me. Let's go one step ahead. My dear friends, you must be knowing neem today is a is a very, very uh, you know important crop. Important crop, not because it's neem. You can have uh, toothpaste of it, you can have uh, you know some insecticides, some pesticides of it, you can have so many other parameters, you can have neem soaps, you can have uh, uh, what you call neem cake and things like that, which is insect free and uh, which control many diseases, uh, which boost your uh, immunity as well. I'm not talking from that point of view. This is one information, one piece of information I thought I would put be, uh, before you. And that is today neem is a commercial crop. Commercial crop through a government notification, a simple notification and 2014 came from government of India it said the neem, entire urea in our country has to be neem coated. And this one single notification has changed whole perception. Because when we say neem coated urea, doesn't mean that you will take the leaves, you will grind them, you will make an extract of it and throw it on the urea before it, 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 it forms the granules. No, that is not the case. And it is not mixing of neem with the urea, it is neem coated. So we'll have to make a coat on every single granule of urea. And when we say that, we, we mean it's oil, which is used for making such a thin layer. You can ask me what the benefits it has got that I can explain in detail. But then you have neem oil that is sprayed when urea is uh, manufactured and in the factory, uh, it's sprayed in such a way that all the granules are equally coated with uh, this one. Then once this uh, notification came, industry was a little uh, 
you know rushy to it and then they started uh, diluting because the neem was uh, neem oil was not available into that huge quantities and therefore they started diluting it in 1918 um sorry 2018 or 2019 i feel 2018 it was another notification came yeah it was 2018 another notification came there were some amendments and the final one says that neem coated urea means the spray you do on urea would necessarily should uh, would, would necessarily have minimum of 30 ppm of azeal reactant so now another factor has been inserted into it and that factor is that you will have to have neem oil which should be diluted not more than to the extent that you maintain the content of aja by 30 ppm now that becomes a big uh, big challenge how do you have neem which produces more uh, you know oil as well as maintains high aja content aja reactant content because in neem that bitter content when you you chew the leaves or you find little bitterness it is because of aja content and that is what is more important neem oil neem leaves neem bark has nothing to do anything it's as simple as that of any other tree but it is that aja that aja reactant content that matters and when we started analyzing that we, we, we these are few of those uh, you know bottles i have put here and these each one of them contain neem oil from different genotypes you would say some of them are still in liquid form some of them are still in liquid form some of them have you know uh, i would say semi liquid and some have some have become totally solid this one this one this one and you could just see the solid crystals here is semi liquid some some semi uh, you know liquid and when we i started analyzing it we found there so much of variability exists and again i would say had i been working on an exotic perhaps i would have not found that kind of variability the classical example is that of jetropha jetropha failed somebody might argue it has not but i i say it has failed across across india because it was an exotic there was no variability existing here and if that is the case then we are in a very very bad situation uh i would not go with this example but this is another example i would say how tree improvement contributes uh dr shivani dr shivani yes sir yes sir yeah you will have to indicate sir, me when i have to stop my uh, presentation yes, otherwise sir. i don't know i would i would keep talking and then uh, sir shivani should not feel bored you have half an hour sir sir half an hour half an hour and you want Sir, you want more? You can, or before that also you can, sir. Up to no. you, sir. I have, I have no issues. I can keep talking. Your students should not feel like uh, caught. No, no, sir. It's okay, sir. Okay. And uh, this is one uh, classical example of uh, tree improvement and impact of tree improvement, uh, tree tree improvement as a whole in a in a in a in a society. How the society accepts it. till date we have been talking about three four species in major north india if you come we talk about poplar throughout country we talk about uh, eucalypts and in southern parts basically we speak about casuarinas so these are three major commercial crops one of them is one of the most wonderful scaffolding that is casuarina equisitifolia as a very very tough wood north india if you come one has changed whole perception of plywood that is uh, uh, populus deltoides and eucalyptus is in between it plays ma ma majority of roles in uh, plywood um, not quality plywood a rough uh, plywood uh, paper industry it has changed whole perception as a whole and uh, so on and so forth but then you have very very limited uh, options available with you very very limited options if you want to grow for agroforestry either go for these three crops if you fail there i feel you fail uh, everywhere and therefore there was a pressure that we'll have to come up with some other alternate materials and one of such materials we started working was milia dubia it's a you know synonym to milia composita so when we started working upon that these are few photographs we have taken uh, i feel dr shivani was working with me at that point of time at that point of time somewhere i feel 2005 or 2006 we started working this 
you could just see these are pure plantation of rice species these are those plantations which are on the road side these are the plantations which have been put on the burns of uh, agriculture crops in uh, punjab we know punjab is one of the um, heavily uh, agriculture uh, dominated state uh, 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 species uh, dominated uh, you know um, state and they they are also fond of agroforestry particularly on burns and all that so just you could see the quality and then these are irrigated uh, pure plantations so these are four type of photographs we found and we started working on this so when we started working on this just uh, just uh, you know look at uh, look at this this is uh, this is uh, this is the condition where we started under i know unimproved plantation which i have shown in the previous slide slide and these are those irrigated or burnt plantations now we started working upon that and the result is that today you have a plantations like this and if i go with the individual tree you could see the kind of straight bowl you have got you could just see what the kind of clear bowl you have got and now look at those plantations these are few plantations which have been established after selecting those materials bringing them to a platform putting them in different environmental conditions putting them in different environmental conditions that called g into e genotype into environmental interactions these are the conditions these are the you know trials give us an a clear indication how a particular genotype what the worth of genetic worth uh, what 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 the genetic worth of an individual has been and if you look at uh, like look at this four this this uh, this is a photograph from uh, one of our trials which is uh, which is established in, uh, in in uttar pradesh this is another trial and in in punjab this is a trial which have, we have put in uh, you know uttarakhand and this is from haryana so this is same one single genetic material one set of single uh, genotypic materials of about 20 25 genotypes we have put across different regions and you could see their performance at micro level there could be many factors but at least at one factor you could just see what kind of straight bowl what kind of you know diameter it is maintaining and then if you go further this how you find this how you find stability there would not be there would not be any doubt that there will be some genotypes would which which would be stable there would be some genotypes which will be you know interacting with the environment much more than otherwise and there will be some genotypes which will be coolly playing their own roles so if you look at them see if i if i can just put this whole set of genotypes into this graph you could just see that this is how it comes so this this is if you take uh, in the previous slide when i was showing the theoretical slide there was one model which called everhard and russell's model it says when you are uh, uh, you know regression is zero that genotype is considered to be most uh, stable genotype so um, uh, i'm i'm sorry when uh, regression is one then this is called uh, most stable genotype so these are the genotypes which have fallen on this dotted black line which are stable but then you have to find out these are stable but are they productive or not so we have gone for these genotypes which are productive but these are the genotypes which are not productive these are the genotypes which are on the upper circle they are very very productive but they are not stable their performance is bound to change with change in environment it is something like this a student with x teacher does well but he is highly highly susceptible with the teacher and the moment the teacher resigns his performance or her performance comes down so these are those genotypes they are very very vulnerable section these are very bright students but if you don't get a good teacher these genotypes are not these students are not going to do well same is the case with uh, with uh, you know any of the biological material genotypically they are very good but they are good as long as they are in a good environmental condition so this plays a very big role so when i said this theoretically perhaps you people would have not uh, thought that it's practically also possible but here i am giving an example this dr shivani has been part of this analysis has been part of this program and we have done it uh, in a very collaborative manner 